Well, if I were to ask you what kind of king you would choose, if you could choose a type of king, a monarch, a dictator, if you will, you heard Andrea allude to it, and also Michael in the comments of what kind of king Jesus is as the Messiah, would we prefer an aggressive warlike king who by dominance of the countries around could in fact let the gravy train of wealth flow to us and we could flex our muscles and say, we rule the world? Or would we rather follow a king, a Messiah, who comes humble with compassion, who puts the needs of his subjects above himself always and who ushers in an age of peace so that all who live under his rule are full of joy. Jesus is the Messiah who rides into Jerusalem's gates on the back of a donkey and the people caught the sense of this one, the Messiah, who was coming to them, and they drew all kinds of conclusions about it. How many of you uh, saw pictures, images, video footage of Pope Francis as he was chosen and ushered in? Come on. All right. Well, he was hailed as being a humble man as he's chosen for this significant role of leadership for our brothers and sisters in the Roman Catholic Church. They were excited about his character, his beliefs, his priorities of emphasis, and the conclusions that they are drawing about the implications and impact for the Roman Catholic Church under his leadership. So also as Jesus rides onto the back of that donkey into Jerusalem, and they're praising God because the Messiah has come. They are thinking of passages of Scripture that talk about victory over all the enemies and throwing off the rod of the oppressor and unprecedented wealth. They're thinking about rule of the world. They're thinking about peace. Well, let's set that image aside for a minute and let's talk about betrayal. The word itself is kind of ugly and harsh, isn't it? Betrayal. It literally means breaking or violating trust, violating love, betraying loyalty, usually in support of those who are sworn to be the enemy. So it's not just the violation of promise, it's also that you partner up with every force that has worked against you in your life. Betrayal. I looked up on the web some of the biggest betrayers in history. I don't know if you've heard of this guy. Alfred Rendel of Austria. Sold out Austria to Serbia and to Russia. And it's estimated that by his selling of secrets, as many as half a million Austrians lost their lives. Betrayal. We know, of course, of Marcus Brutus, the friend of Julius Caesar, who took part in the Senate's overthrow of Julius Caesar, attacking him in public. And Caesar looking at Brutus as Brutus's knife dripped with blood in that famous line, et tu Brutus? There's nothing pretty about betrayal, is there? Maybe more recently, you know the name of oh, oh, one more. Benedict Arnold, the American general hero who became, and this is where we get the term, turncoat, traitor to the British. And when they were going to capture Benedict Arnold as a traitor, he caught a British frigate back to Britain, and he and his family lived the rest of their life in England. But it says, that the Brits never trusted him and wanted nothing to do. In more recent history, Aldrich Ames, 
fueled by his addiction to alcohol and an overly ambitious wife, sold U.S. government secrets to Russia in the 1980s. He was paid 4.6 million total, compromised 100 military operations, and the execution of 10 U.S. officers. He's spending the rest of his life in prison. We know about the prayer. Delilah betraying strong man, God's strong man, her lover Samson. Or Absalom, the son of King David, who led a rebellion against his own father's kingdom. Let's come back to the parade of Jesus. Coming into Jerusalem. And not everyone joined the praises that day. But almost everyone who did praise him as king before the week was out changed their tune totally. So the Pharisees and the religious leaders from the beginning wanted to get rid of Jesus. They saw him as dangerous in the dialogue about the grace of the kingdom of God. They were afraid that Jesus, in his dangerous teachings about how God worked, would cause the overthrow of the whole Jewish way of life an abolition of the system of sacrifice, maybe most importantly, they who are in position of power would lose their power and their authority and their influence. And of course, we know about Judas. Most people think it was for greed, but I wonder about that. He was a political zealot. And I think that he was imagining that Jesus was going to be a political, powerful man who threw off the Roman oppression. And maybe in the betrayal, in some kind of weird work way, he was trying to force Jesus' hand. After all, he had seen Jesus do supernaturally powerful, awesome things. Maybe he thought that if he betrayed him, Jesus would have no choice but to flex his divine muscles and throw off the Roman. But so sold him out. But Peter denied him because he wanted to ride the power train to the top. He wanted to rule with Jesus. And all the disciples deserted him. All the disciples deserted him. In fact, remember that verse in the first chapter of John where it says, he came to his own people and his own people did not receive him. They all deserve it. Pilate abdicated his responsibility for justice, for fear of the crowd, to save his own neck. He failed. And those crowds that were singing Hosanna, who it says were so excited because they had seen his miracles, so they too were drawing all kinds of conclusions about what the Messiah's entrance into Jerusalem would mean for them personally. And by the end of the week, they're going, you mean you're not going to throw off the Romans? You mean you're not going to make us wealthy? Crucify him. And it's easy really for me, maybe for you, to think that if I had been there, I would have seen it clearly. I would have understood it. I never would have change my voice, change my mind, I wouldn't have betrayed him. The truth is, I kind of try and manipulate my relationship with God. Beg God for favors. Delegate him to a periphery of my life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Delegate him to a periphery of my life where my attitude is, don't call me, I'll call you when I need you, but otherwise, why don't you just stay out here a little bit? Not in the center. Yeah, I betray. Betrayal hurts. Broken promises. Sometimes it pulls apart families, businesses, or churches. We all, I think, know what it is to feel betrayed, 
to feel violated, but if we're honest with ourselves, we also know what it feels like when we own the truth that we too have been betrayed. So here's the amazing thing about the type of king who rode the donkeys back into Jerusalem. He is faithful. In the face of my betrayal, in the face of the rejection of the crowd, in the face of Judas and Peter and the religious leaders who wanted nothing to do with them, Jesus knew what his mission was. He knew what the Father's will was. Remember when he said, no one takes my life, I lay it down. He was not the victim of a violent mob rule run amok. The type of crowd that licks its finger and picks it up to the wind to see what they ought to do. He was not a victim in love as the faithful king. He went to the cross for you. There's a powerful verse in Psalm 78, it says, The people flattered him with their mouths. They lied to him with their tongues, for their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in God's covenant. But in contrast, listen to this verse from Psalm 89, verse 33. This is the word of God. I will never take my love from my sons and daughters nor will I ever betray my faith. So the king goes to the cross. There's two ways to be faithful, it seems to me. A person can be faithful even in, either in a singular, heroic event, uh, a pinnacle moment where in the heroism, the faithfulness, brings a result that is irreversible for all people. And Jesus was that, on the cross. But then there's the type of faithfulness, you gonna come help me? <laughs> <laughs> then there's the type of faithfulness that is a long obedience over duration of time. And you know what? Jesus is that too. You know why? Because over and over again after he was not only crucified for you and my sin as the faithful king who bled and died that you and I might believe that betrayers are forgiven. That over and over again he says again, I forgive you. I love you. I forgive you. And somehow the power of the King's word of forgiveness to me and to you empowers us to forgive others who have betrayed us. And my heart longs then to be faithful to Christ. You maybe remember reading or hearing about a seminary student named Ben Larson, a graduate of Luther College, then a student at Warburg Seminary, married to his wife, Renee, and along with his cousin Jonathan, went to Haiti in January of 2010 to teach theology and Bible at a Haitian Lutheran school, staying at St. Joseph's School for Boys, close to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. You remember the massive earth, uh, earthquake that dropped to the ground so many buildings? Well, Ben and his wife Renee and their cousin Jonathan were in the second floor of this dorm room for the school for boys, and the earth began to shake. And as Renee tells the story, her husband Ben went to one of the support pillars in the building, and Renee was a ways away from him, and she found a place in between the light fixtures to stand as the earthquake continued to shook the whole building. And then she watched in horror as cement slabs caved in and fell on her husband Ben and knocked him to the ground. And he was lying there bleeding. And she started running toward her husband. And as she took the first steps, the rest of the two stories above them collapsed. And Ben disappeared in the collapsing concrete. 
screams everywhere, darkness and smell of dust in the air. And they began to look in the rubble, in the holes in the rubble for where Ben might be. And they heard this voice singing. It was Ben's voice. He was way below them in the rubble. Where charity and love prevails. They listened to him sing. Renee got close to an opening where she could hear Ben's voice and she cried out, Ben, we're okay. I love you. Keep singing. But there was no more song. So here was this young man who had given his life to Christ and heard the call of God to ministry and went to a country of Haiti to serve in love and share his belief in the Lord and to teach the word and to help the poor. And in the tragedy of that earthquake, with his last breath, he sang to his Lord, faithful unto death. And there's something, there's something compelling about that story that says to me, I want to be faithful to death until I breathe my last. I want to be faithful to death because Jesus Christ, the King, is faithful to death for us. Son, blessed is the King who comes. Thank you.